So good afternoon, everyone. And what better position to give a talk right after lunch? <laughs> and uh, where I'm from, they call that a setup. <laughs> so we'll see how how it goes. Uh, and and I should say to give a talk about regulatory after lunch. <laughs> That's, that's even worse, but I'm going to try to keep you engaged and uh, see how it goes. Maybe I'll have to tell a few jokes along the way. <laughs> so, uh, so um, let's get right at it. Uh, if I could have the first slide. So this is a pre. This is an outline of my presentation, and um, what I'm going to try to do uh, in in the time allotted is um, provide you an, a global perspective of the regulation of vaccines. And at the end of the presentation, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of the role of, of the regulator and the role of, uh, as well as how the national regulatory authorities are, um, how they assess the benefits and risk uh, for the public. So uh, I'm not gonna read this outline to you, but um, we'll start out uh, with, um, the next slide. Oh, am I? I'm. I that's right. I can control my own slides. Okay. okay. So uh, many of you know, and I know we have a mixed audience here. Some of you probably are regulators. Some of you have probably seen a regulator before, and others, uh, this is your first time. So uh, NRAs are they're really the guardians to ensure safety, efficacy, and quality of vaccines and drugs uh, made available to the public. This, the, 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 they're risk assessors. They, the NRAs, really make the assessment of risk for the public. Uh, they encourage compliance. So they, they do have a, 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 a legal, legal framework that I'll get into later and the regulatory aspects of vaccines. So they make sure that uh, the manufacturers and those who are doing clinical trials are uh, in compliance. And the NRA is also responsible for enforcing rules and regulations and issuing guidelines to regulate vaccine development process, licensing, registration, the manufacturing, marketing, as well as the labeling. And in the last line, I won't read it here, but this is in a few examples of uh, regulators from NRAs um, around the world. Let's see. And then uh, in this slide, I just wanted to give you some examples of, uh, and I, don't, I'm, I won't read this and I don't expect you to read it, but it's, uh, you have the slides, but to give you some idea of the evolution uh, and the historical perspective of, of uh, how regulators and when they were established. FDA is actually, the U United States FDA is, uh, is one of the oldest regulators for, for vaccines. And in fact, uh, uh, the 1906 date that was really for the establishment of the FDA. Uh, the US FDA has been uh, uh, regulating vaccines since 1902 through the Biologics uh, Control Act. Uh, so it's, it's one of the oldest. And, and then uh, the European Medicine Agency, that's more, more recent. And it's, uh, it was set up with funding from the European Union and the pharmaceutical industry. And it, it really uh, uh, is involved in a um, centralized process. And of course you have the member states with there, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along, uh, that are responsible for the individual company, countries. And then the uh, Chinese Regulatory Authority, 1940, uh, the national, uh, not, not, not 1940 was India, 1950 was China. And then more recently, uh, the Food and Drug Authority in Ghana uh, was 1992. So. Uh, the, the, the need for regulatory authorities, national regulatory authorities, uh, we see that growing and uh, uh, more regulatory authorities in our AS are being established um, as, as time goes by. And then there's the role of the World Health Organization in drug regulation. And the World Health Organization is not a regulatory authority. However, they, do, they are critical to the regulatory process, especially for low and middle income countries that uh, may not have a well-established uh, regulatory authority so they can set 
uh, parameters and guidelines and, and, and guidances for, um, for these countries. So they manage a system of regulatory exchange of information between member states on the safety and efficacy of pharmaceutical products, including vaccines. And uh, they identify and cons consolidate current options as key regulatory issues. And they communicate these to national regulatory authorities. And not just to, they're not communicating these guidances just to uh, the, uh, say the national regulatory authorities who are not as uh, mature as some of the others, but all of them. Uh, they inform uh, NRAs on scientific background, they advise on different regulatory approaches to be taken for certain uh, methodologies. Uh, they issue norms and standards through their expert committees. And they also ensure the quality, safety, and efficacy of uh, uh, limited health, <coughs> pardon me, high public health value essential medicines and vaccines. And then they also, most importantly, facilitate the exchange of regulatory information uh, through regulatory authorities, as well as among regulatory authorities. And then uh, the WHO created a uh, global benchmarking tool. And this benchmarking tool was uh, established in 1997. And it's a, it's a, a um, tool used to evaluate and strengthen regulatory programs. It aims to uh, strengthen the capacity of regional, sub-regional, and national regulatory authorities it works with countries to apply these, uh, this uh, tool uh, as part of a five-step approach to improve the National Regulatory Authority's capacity building, and also with uh, uh, priority given to regulatory systems strengthening for developing countries. Although this tool is used for all evaluating all regulatory authorities, the US FDA, they've gone through this uh, evaluation by the WHO, so it doesn't matter where you are in the in the hierarchy, everybody uh, is assessed and evaluated by the WHO to make sure that uh, we continue to uh, make sure our, our uh, regulatory um, guidance and regulations and the whole process uh, is strong and consistent. Now, stepping back a little bit, uh, how did, you know, what was the need? Why do we, why do we need a, a regulatory authority? Um, a lot of folks will say they're just really, they just really get in the way. I have really good products. I'm manufacturing, I'm inventing wonderful products that's going to cure every uh, known illness to man. Why do we have to have these old regulators in the way? Well, again, it's, it's critical uh, because they are, um, the risk assessors for the public. So regulation evolved through the evolution of science. So in the 19th century, uh, sciences such as chemistry, physiology, pharmacology, and others, this really laid a foundation for the modern drug research and development, not only, for the, not only uh, through the evolution uh, for regulators, but also for manufacturing and uh, developing new products. So it was a renaissance in, in the science that really was the foundation to the development of new products, new drugs, as well as the regulatory, and being able to have the scientific base for um, the regulatory authority. And then like uh, most things, uh, especially in some parts of the world, uh, we don't listen until there's a tragedy. Uh, you know, we really need this, but you know, eh, don't worry about that. And then when there's a tragedy, it affects the public uh, in a very large manner, then you have your governments reacting. So governments are very reactive, uh, not very proactive. So tragic events such as the diethylene glycol poisoning and the thalidomide disaster, this facilitated a strong regulatory system uh, in the United States. Um, and so in 1930, there was, there was an example of 100 people in the, uh, who died of diethylene glycol poisoning and this was followed by the use of sulfamylonide elixir, uh, which was used as a solvent without any safety testing. Because back then, you didn't have to test products for safety. You didn't have to test them for efficacy either. Uh, you just sold them. And this, this really, this incident facilitated the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, with pre-marketing notification. So this required products to be approved. And this was um, um, uh, enacted in 1938. And then between 1958 and 1960, um, thalidomide was introduced to 46 countries worldwide, 
resulting in 10,000 babies being born with uh, uh, psychomelia and other deformities. And so this just really, um, really drove the uh, point across that we really need to be evaluating these products uh, before they go into humans, whether for safety and efficacy. And then uh, other historical incidents, uh, there was a diphtheria break, outbreak in the 1890s and uh, uh, diphtheria antitoxin is uh, equine derived at the time. And it's in 1901, you had 14 children die of tetanus contaminated diphtheria antitoxin, of course, because back then there was no control over manufacturing. And so uh, there was no product safety testing. And so this is where the 1902 date comes in uh, the Virus Serum and Antitoxin Act or the Biological Control Act. And this made sure uh, in the United States that the facility which you're manufacturing the product, it had to be licensed. Before this, not a, that was not an issue. The product has to be licensed. The label has to be evaluated. Your facilities are inspected. This gave um, the government the authority through Congress to enforce this. And then the Food and Drug Act that brought in the other products like small molecules in 1906, where the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the United States was established. And then in the UK, there have been uh, committees uh, on safety of drugs that started in 1963, followed by voluntary adverse reaction reporting, uh, the yellow card in 64. Uh, we had a Drug Amendments Act in 62 in the United States. And this required all drug applications based on proof of safety and effectiveness. With the previous acts, safety was the biggest requirement by the, or, or requirement by the federal government. This act uh, made sure that effectiveness was evaluated and enforced. Uh, hard to believe that it took us till 1960 to you know, <laughs> decide that, yeah, you, we, we should really check and see if these products work. But you know we're slow, uh, so the FDA was also given authority and compliance of CGMPs, and uh, that's current uh, good manufacturing practices, and this made it enforceable to so that officially registered drug establishments or facilities and implement other requirements like process validation and all of these things that are required to make sure that your product is safe and that is uh, can be manufactured consistently. And then one of the fundamental criteria for uh, a national regulatory authority is to have a legal framework. And this is required because if you don't have a legal, how do you enforce something if you don't have a legal framework? It's just, um, it's just happenstance if you don't have it really enforced in the law uh, so that you, you can require uh, these companies to do this. And just a little civics lesson in the United States, uh, we have the executive branch and this is the, the executive branch is the president that, that, that starts with the president and that establishes the responsible institutions uh, as well as their respective functions. And so ex ex executive branch, the FDA is part of the, the executive branch through uh, our minister of health. We call it uh, the Department of Health and Human Services most countries call it, or many countries call it, the Minister of Health. So that's at the executive branch. And then you have the legislative branch, and the legislative branch creates laws and regulations and decrees. And so this is where the legal framework starts. So you have establishment of the agency. Congress says, these are the laws that, we, that you can enforce through your agency. And then so that creates laws that provide an overall and general guidance and it defines the scope of what's regulated and what's not. You hear these debates about, well, my product, this is this is not this really doesn't fall into the law, so it's not regulated. And there there's sometimes um, intense debates about what products should be regulated or are regulated through the legislation. And then, but but equally important, the regulatory authority has to be flexible because science is not you can't pigeonhole science. And there was a time at the FDA when there were actually regulations that prescribed how to make a product. So for instance, polio vaccine, you had to follow these steps. And if you deterred from any of those steps, you were not in compliance. 
And that made no sense. Because suppose you came up with a better technology than what this outline is. You're up against the law. And so the regulatory authority has to be flexible. And what the FDA did was they got rid of those laws. I said, no, we, gotta, we have to, you know, you, you got to go through a process. But they got rid of them because it didn't, the, 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 the laws on the books, the regulations didn't keep up with the science. So going forward, you write the regulations such that they will allow the, the science to be flexible. You, can, you can't really write a law that says, thou shalt make this product this way. But what you can say is, here are the, here are the guide rails. As long as you're within these guide rails, you're okay. And as long as you can validate what you're doing, you're, you're okay. And so that's why the regulatory authority has to be flexible to keep up with the science. And that's where guidelines and guidance documents comes in and FDA and other, other regulatory authorities all over the world. They come up with these because these are not really laws, they're guidance. This is the current thinking of the regulatory authority at that time. And these will change as the science change. And so you also have to be transparent and well-defined. And so the processes and procedures must be applied in, in a consistent manner. You can't say, and I, I used to hear this when I was at FDA, you get an academic investigator saying, well, you know, I'm an, I'm an academic. I don't have any money and I don't have anybody to inter interpret the rules for me. So I know you have a separate section for me, right? No, <laughs> we don't. Uh, it, so no matter, no matter whether you're a big farmer or a little academic, they have to be applied consistently. And, and that's important. And that's important for the, the, the point of transparency because the public needs to know how are these decisions made? And as you see through, through evolution, you see a lot of decisions on regulatory, from the regulatory authorities that are now published on the web. When something's approved, it's published on the web. How, what, how did, how did they, what data did they look at? How did they make that decision? It's, public, it's published on the web. So you can read that. And, and the process is transparent. And, and the guidance documents, the guidance documents, when they're created, they're also published for review prior to uh, enacting these, these are, pub we are published and they, and they go into review for the public and public can make comments on. So flexible, very transparent uh, process. And then there are, there are other outside organizations like the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authority. And this is an outside group established based on the need to uh, strategically address current and emerging global medicine, uh, medicine regulatory and safety challenges. And where this comes in is really looking at harmonization and, and convergence of the regulatory uh, uh, process and rules. I mean, uh, you'll, you'll, most people ask this all the time. Well, why, is that, why was that approved in the United States and if it wasn't approved in Europe or vice versa? Or why, why is this product approved here? And you guys are saying, you know, we have some recent examples, don't we? Uh, <laughs> Well, where's that vaccine? You know, which is what I'm talking about for COVID. Where is that vaccine? It's, it's been in the queue for a very long time, but, and, and uh, I don't know how many countries have approved it, but the US FDA, they haven't done it. They have, the, the word is, they haven't done anything yet. Well, they have done a lot, but <laughs> they, they're still reviewing it. And so this organization has tried to, they, they bring together, it, it was informal group of leaders uh, some of them were uh, former uh, heads of regulatory authorities, and they bring folks together to collaborate and communicate about approaches uh, to, adjust, to address common challenges. Like, for instance, with, with the pandemic, uh, this group came together to, to make decisions and to, to make recommendations on, well, what should be in the, in the guidance? How should they, what should be the endpoints of, of clinical trials? And of course, this is not binding, but at least the discussion is going on and they're trying to reach some kind of agreement uh, together. Um, because oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you scratch your head and say, well, this vaccine is gonna be used for humans, right? And in your country, you have humans and we have humans. So why do we have different, <laughs> so why do we need different? Uh, and so, you know, you gotta have these, it, it, it seems obvious, but you have to have these discussions. And why you have to have these discussions is because of benefit risk. Yeah, we all, we're all humans, but there may be a different uh, impact in one country versus the other. There are different factors. So you have to look at these also. And the benefit risk is it could be different from country to country. And so those things will come up as well. 
And then there's the ICH. The ICH is the International Council for Harmonization. So again, the ICMRA, ICH, these are two organizations that are trying to bring the uh, regulatory authorities together as far as um, guidance and, and requirements. So ICH was established in 2015, and then it became the International Conference on Conference. It was the Co International Conference on Harmonization. Now it's the International Council on Harmonization. And they try to ach achieve harmonization through developing guidelines, technical requirements for the development and approval of, of uh, safety monitoring. Um, the regulatory, they have regulatory members and they adopt guidelines. And these guidelines, once you adopt them, because this, this was the deal, we come together, we adopt these guidelines, we, we need to be implementing these guidelines. So you can't skip on them and say, yeah, I was at the meeting, but I'm not gonna enforce these. No, this is a commitment. And so harmonization is achieved through the development of ICH guidelines via a process of scientific consensus. And the good thing about the um, ICH, you have regulatory authorities as well as industry experts, and they come to an agreement on, um, on what these guidance are. And especially when, you, when you're looking at manufacturing and things like that, regulators, it depends on whether they have labs and many don't in the world. Uh, they don't have a lot of ex hands-on experience of manufacturing. And so you do need that industry experience to come in and say, you know, here's a process that's industry standards. So shifting gears, I'm gonna say a little bit about vaccine development and manufacturing. So mo uh, many of you know uh, the difference between drug substance and drug product, but many of you are not in this area. So what we call the drug substance, that's the unformulated active substance. That's the immunogen. And then, so this, this could be subsequently, may or may not be, need to be subsequently uh, formulated with excipients to produce the drug product. And these excipients are things like preservatives, adjuvants if needed. Um, and so you have a, a, the drug substance uh, examples are bacterial cells, viruses, parasites, whatever, but they're, they're the immunogen. And then, as I mentioned, they're formulated with uh, excipients such as adjuvants and what have you uh, to become the drug product. And then on the drug product, this is what this is your final final dosage form of the product, and it contains not only the drug the vaccine drug substance, but it's formulated with a finished uh, dosage from which is ready for the market. And as I said, they're adjuvants, they're stabilizers, they're excipients, they're you know, it's like make it's like anything you make, you know, if you make bread and it's going to sit on the shelf, you need something to stabilize it to hold the date for at least, uh, of course, here you don't you make bread fresh every day. So it's not yeah, so but for countries where we don't get fresh bread every day, um, you got to have some preservative there to keep it on the shelf for a month or so. Uh, and then your final formulation may be diluted mixed with uh, the excipients, as I mentioned to you. And this is, this is what's in the bottle, the drug product. And manufacturing is hard. And you know, that's an understatement, it's complex, and especially for new vaccines. And these really present challenges to national regulatory authorities. And the reason, one of the reasons is because as I stated, many of the national regulatory authorities don't have the resources or facilities, testing facilities, uh, and, and to do research and development on their own. And so this really presents a challenge to some newly vented uh, regulatory authorities. And that's why, you know, the WHO is very important and, and serves a very important function uh, because they bring together uh, um, regulatory authorities at different levels. And so they can collaborate. So uh, you see a lot of new technologies, especially today, uh, evaluation of the non-clinical and clinical data. Some countries, you know, you, you, you may be doing a clinical trial with, uh, you know, and the vaccine is gonna go into pregnant women. And then if you don't have the experience, you may forget that, well, we do need to do some kind of reprotox studies and DART studies. And, and so it's, 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 it, it becomes complicated depending on your target population and, and, and the product. So you have to develop testing, assays, you have to develop potency assays, you know, how, how much, uh, how well does the product work? What is the, what is the activity? And then uh, looking at uh, risk management, uh, you know, evaluating risk management plans, depending on 
uh, what type of product is being used, pharmacovigilance, uh, depending on, again, what, what uh, the product is and designing those studies, designing studies that may go from um, a, an adult population into pediatrics. Um, so it's really uh, critical to be able to accept, uh, 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 assess the complexities. And sometimes it really, this, this uh, takes time. I mean, because some of the regulatory authorities are learning on the fly uh, to really come up to speed. Because if you just develop the technology of the day, uh, yes, they can keep up with the literature and things like this, but how to set parameters to evaluate that product to uh, be used in, a, in an overall population, uh, that's a challenge. And so switching to the stages of regulatory review, many of you know that uh, there's uh, a development process stage as far as from the regulatory perspective, starting with an investigational or experimental drug application and going through the classical three phases, safety and immunogenicity, proof of concept, and then your phase two, safety, immunogenicity, and then trying to determine your dose, your dose ranging. And then of course your efficacy study or effectiveness study in your phase three. And today, even though it's not in the regulations, there are intermittents. So you hear a lot of things about, oh, we're gonna do a phase two B, things like that. And so that's not codified, but that's uh, typically accepted. Everybody accepts that, that there may be additional in-between studies before you get to a pivotal phase three study. And then in the United States, the, the marketing application is really, it's called a biologics license application. And this is a review of all the data to support licensure of that product. And then of course your facility, since it's required by law to uh, meet GMPs and be licensed, it's a pre-approval inspection. So all the facilities, the whole process, all of the facilities where you're making the product, and it might be many sites. And you see the regulatory authorities will visit those sites and look at the manufacturing process to determine whether you uh, have the facility to make that product. I've seen a lot of products have great clinical trials, but if you can't make, if you can't make the product every day the same way, forever, then you're not going to get licensed. So you have to show that you can consistently manufacture the product. Uh, it's not just that clinical trial. Uh, and then, of course, post licensure has become so important now. When I started out in this business, it was like, yeah, you, yeah, you can do a little bit. <laughs> but now it's, it's critical because we have, with the technologies we, we're using, and we can't do these gigantic studies. Uh, we just can't. It's not feasible. And so you have to look at uh, how these products are uh, performing post-licensure. And, and some of the studies, some of post-licensure studies are required uh, by the authorities so that you can continue to follow, increase your safety database because most vaccines, clinical trials are done in pristine populations, healthy adults. But you know, when the product is licensed, it's going to be expo um, all over the map of people exposed to that product. So you have to follow um, in doing pro licensure. And then you also have to follow for safety because, you know, you do a study of 50,000 and you see an adverse event and one in 100,000, you're going to miss it. But you can't, but you can't do every study at 100,000 people. There have been a few, but <laughs> you, you, it's not feasible. And then, of course, uh, with the US FDA and most regulatory authorities, every lot is released, or there's some kind of program to evaluate lots, like, and, and so to make sure that the manufacturing is consistent. And then in, in, the, in the US, there are biennial inspections uh, for um, the products once they're licensed. And in the US, there's three pathways to licensure. One is your good old traditional pathway, the randomized control trial. And then there's accelerated approval, and that's your basing licensure on a surrogate. And so it, and a surrogate may be immunogenicity. So you haven't done a full blown F efficacy study, but it's, it, it's required um, with an accelerated approval. Then there's the animal rule. And um, I see Adam coming my way. So that means my clock is running. <laughs> so uh, 
And then in Europe, you have a centralized process or a decentralized process. And I mentioned about centralized process run by the, uh, by the EMEA, the European Medicines Agent Authority, and decentralized product by your member states. And then there are expedited review, review programs in the US. Uh, and these are, and, and other regulatory authorities too, like uh, the EMEA. And these are really uh, for moving forward products that are meeting an unmet medical need in a, uh, prevention and treatment of serious and life-threatening diseases. So again, part of that flexibility with the National Regulatory Authority is to uh, create these type of programs so you can uh, move forward on products that may be um, uh, potentially uh, meet an unmet medical need. You heard mention of real world evidence, real world evidence. Uh, this is a clinical evidence regarding the usage of potential benefits. We see real world evidence for safety post licensure, but there's a trend now to try to look at world, uh, real world evidence for effectiveness. So far with vaccines, it's been, very, it's been a very slow process, but uh, this, is, this is where agencies are moving. And I think in the next slide, well, and then there's real world data. So you, you generate real, real world data to um, support the real world effectiveness. And real world data is really from examples like electronic health records, uh, claims and billing activities, product and disease registries, things of this nature uh, that may be used for uh, making a decision on real world effectiveness. And there are several countries, this is just to name a few, that have a framework. FDA has, a, US FDA has a framework uh, as when, when this publication came out, uh, Health Canada did not, EMEA has started, MH, MHRA has not, but they're moving. I mean, this is evolving. And I left a um, reference here. So you can, you, this is a really good paper to read on uh, real world evidence for regulatory decision-making across the world because we cannot, we, we cannot continue to do these really, really large studies. And when you really wanna know, once the product is being used, how is it working? And if you could have a control prospect, prospective trial to determine that, this, the ultimate goal is to use this type of data to make changes to products and, and, and get those licensed uh, or to e eventually maybe use these data to actually license a product. Vaccines, not yet. Some of the small molecules, it, they have. Uh, and then I had some uh, emergency use. Most of you, I think in this climate, know what emergency use authorization is. There's different flavors depending on what side of the world you're on, but that's what we use. And this is the first time it's ever been used uh, for a vaccine de novo, and that's COVID vaccine. And lots of debate on should we have done it? I think most people would answer that question. Yeah, we didn't have much of a choice, but this is a very complex uh, pathway because never before have we given tens and hundreds of millions of individuals an unapproved product um, for use. And again, it's an authorization. It's not a regulatory approval pathway. It's an authorization. It's designed, it was designed in the United States to deal with countermeasures, counterterrorism measures, uh, but was also later applied to things like pandemics. And one of the big differences is you're looking at, the regulators are looking at data in real time and they're looking at it in parallel. So it, it's not before, and before traditional phase one, phase two, phase three. No, it's just generate the data and give it to me and let me review it and make a decision. So it's a very, it's a very fast process. I think it's, it's working, but uh, you know, the verdict is, is still out there. And then, um, so I don't need to go through all of this. EMA, they have a conditional marketing authorization. That's how they use uh, uh, for emergency use. And it's the same sort of thing, looking at benefit risk uh, and really trying to address uh, that uh, uh, emergency situation like a pandemic. And then the WHO, they have the emergency use listing procedure. And this is sort of the same requirements, but this is to be listed so that your product, if it meets all of the requirements, then it can be listed as, a, as a being available uh, for use if a country wants to adopt that. 
And I'm almost there. This is, this, this is a really important slide and, and a lot of lessons from this. And, and we, learned, we, we, we learned through this uh, with the COVID and it's protecting the integrity of regulatory agencies and processes. And this is really a tenet of the um, WHO benchmark. The regulatory authority needs to be quasi-independent from the government. So if you're reviewing data on the scientific data, decisions have to be made on science and the evaluation of science. And the Minister of Health or any other politician should not be able to intervene in that process. So regulatory agencies, they're uniquely tasked to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the product for the public. This is a critical role during public health emergencies because when other stakeholders typically have conflicting political or economic interests. So the regulators should be independent to make independent decisions because if you're gonna use something like an emergency use authorization, you do have to streamline the process. But again, you're streamlining the process based on the science, not, the, not based on the call from the Minister of Health saying, you're going too slow. You can't, you have to have that autonomy. And I think with the COVID, this shows how in turbulent times, the public health tools such as vaccines and other medicines, they can sometimes get all wrapped up in the political uh, arena and subsumed in other debates such as personal autonomy or government authority but the regulators need to be quasi independent. So while all regulatory decisions are benefit risk, which in an emergency is really critical, it's, it's using limited data with greater than normal uncertainty. And so it must be based on unbiased database and a deliberative process. So in summary, the assessment licensure and control of surveillance of new generation vaccines these do present major challenges to national regulatory authorities. Increasing number of novel vaccines, complex quality concerns, and new technical issues. So the role of the national regulatory authorities around the world is to ensure the safety, quality, and efficacy of human medical products, including vaccines, with sound, legal, and scientific procedures. So in conclusion, the last paragraph, this is the take home. Regulatory, authority by, uh, regulatory bodies provide st strategic, tactical, and operational direction and support for working within the regulations. So I have to work within the law, albeit I have to and must be able to provide flexibility where feasible and scientifically supported to expedite the development and delivery of safe and effective products. It is, our, it is the national regulatory role to facilitate getting products to the market. It's not to be a, a stumbling block. It's not to be a, a gatekeeper to say, well, I'll decide tomorrow. No, we have to make sure, regulatory authorities have to make sure that we facilitate getting good, safe, effective products to the market. And that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> two quick observations. First is that uh, Norman, over the years since he left the FDA, has become progressively less well regulated <laughs> with regard to his ability to keep to time. So you only have five minutes and I'm not sure you'll cover all of these questions. The other is I'm noticing people holding up their phones and taking photos of the slides. That's completely unnecessary because all of the slides are available to you through the ADPAC website. So please stop doing that because it just gets in the way of people behind. Norman, choose your question. Okay. I thought I had a discussion session. This you have, it? but you've, you've used most Whoa. of it up. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> you've got five minutes. All right. Left. You. 20 minutes. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. The right hand uh, okay. So um, I was wondering, you mentioned the accelerated approval pathway uh, as one of the pathways, and I know that chikungunya vaccine is going through this right now. Is there any examples from vaccines in the past and what data were used as a basis? Oh yeah, lots of examples. Influenza was one. A lot of the influenza vaccines were used, uh, were, were licensed based on accelerated approval, based on immunogenicity as the, ser as the surrogate, and then they later did uh, efficacy, pro um, efficacy studies for phase four to support full approval. 
the meninges vaccines, meninges B, they were accelerated approval. Uh, so there have been many where based on a surrogate, if we know it, if we have a surrogate, then we could do, we could do that. And generally the surrogate is immunogenicity. Uh, let's take one from the back. Gentlemen right here. I'm, I'm just... um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Anthony from Ghana. Um, so I was very excited when I came across real world data for the first time. And I thought that perhaps this was something that was be going to be helpful um, especially for developing economies. Um, what we see is that most national FDAs are not keen on off-label use um, for, for some drugs, um, but we want to move towards the use of real-world data. The confusion for me as an investigator or research scientist has been that what would be your recommendation to how we match this or how we approach FDA to to see the use of real world data without necessarily compelling to do a trial, yeah, because then we miss the point of not being allowed to use off label and at the same time. Um, well, the most important thing is to do a prospective study. So you can't just do real world evidence and just will just you know ad hoc and go collect some data. That's not going to get it. You have to do a pro uh, You have to have a prospective study uh, and protocol and with endpoints of what you're going to look at in and how you're going to use that real world data to apply it to a real world effective. And that's hard. It's, 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 it's not easy. And that's probably why we haven't approved a vaccine yet with real world evidence. But labeling changes are coming with this. Again, if you do uh, a prospectively designed study to look at that. We already use real world data for uh, examining safety. So yes. it's, it's dual. All right, I know he's gonna bring the hook soon. <laughs> so. Hi, I'm Daniel from Brazil. Thank you for the presentation. It's still unclear to me how different NRA communicate between each other. Um, for instance, Coronavac was approved in Chile for children three years old, uh, over three years old, but not in Brazil. And Visa didn't accept. Do they exchange and do they talk between each other? That's one quick question. The second one is, for instance, Brazil used data or approvals from FDA to approve uh, locally. What about vice versa? How does a more um, traditional R NRA see <laughs> local RN approvals to uh, bring the product to states, for instance? Well, it's, it's, it's somewhat complex. I mean, yes, regulators do talk. Uh, some have uh, memorandums of understanding where they, they talk all the time. The US and the EMEA and Health Canada, they talk a lot. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to come to necessarily an agreement at the end of the day. But also, there are statutory uh, laws that require countries to make these assessments. So in the US, you can use data from anywhere in the world, but to say we're going to base an approval on another regulatory authority, uh, they, that's, they don't do that because, and a lot of regulatory authorities don't do it either because of the statutory requirements. Now, there are probably ways to get over that, but uh, it, it's something about sovereignty as well. So there's the, the, the face of the politics again. Last point. Okay. One more. Oh, in the back. Sorry, but I'll be here. I'll be here. You can talk to me. Yeah. Thank you. Andrea from Guatemala. I have an example and a question. In my country, we don't have a vaccines for children, but recently Moderna vaccine was authorized in other countries like yeah, well, in Europe and Australia. And we do have a Moderna in Guatemala. So we starting to use have those of Moderna in Guatemala using children, but it wasn't authorized by FDA of the WHO. So for us, the use of these uh, product without these authorizations was hard. It, was, it wasn't our decision, it was a government's decision. So there is some a larger authority or we have to be lead by our local authority what, what happened in this case? 
in, in some situations, the recommending bodies will differ from the regulators. In the United States, we have the same thing where it's, if, 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 if it's looking at additional data and, and, and making a decision based on, on, on the population. And again, with the, reg, with the regulatory approval, it's really bound by the law, by law. So, but you do, you will see divergence between the, the recommending bodies and, and the authorities. So it, it gets hairy though, when you're using an off-label like that and the uh, manufacturer hasn't sanctioned that. So in your label, it's strict. The manufacturer's label is very strict as how to use this product. And you as the government are saying, we're gonna use it a different way. You have to think about liability.